Chapter 1 A Privileged Young Man Toward the end of the presidential campaign of 1824, John Quincy Adams, one of the four candidates for the office, left his duties as Secretary of State in Washington and returned to his home in Quincy, Massachusetts, there to roam around the cemetery and look at tombstones of his ancestors and mediate on the past and future. He walked among the graves of the four generations of his father's family. He singled out the tomb of Henry Adams, the first to come from England and settle in Braintree, now Quincy, around 1640. Then there was Joseph Adams Sr. and his wife Abigail Baxter, and Joseph Adams Jr. and his second wife Hannah Bass. John Quincy Adams paused for a bit and gazed at the grave of his paternal grandfather, John Adams Sr., and his wife, Susanna Boylston. The family continues to grow, he mused. Now, in 1824, there were three succeeding generations of male Adamses still living. His father, John Adams, the former president, himself, the present Secretary of State, and his brother, Thomas Boylston, and then the third generation, among whom were his children, George Washington, John II, and Charles Francis. Pass another century, Adams noted in his diary, and we shall all be moldering in the same dust. I wonder, he added, who then of our posterity shall visit this yard, and what shall he read engraved upon the stones? Since then, another century and more have passed, and surely those who look upon the graves of this family cannot but recognize that here lie the remains of supremely gifted men and women who served their country with distinction and added to its luster. The secretary did not mention his mother's ancestors in his musings and that could be an important key in understanding his character and personality. But they, too, brought a degree of greatness to the family tree. He was named after his maternal great-grandfather, John Quincy, who died on the 13th of July, 1767, the day after I had received his name in baptism, the secretary later wrote. His mother, Abigail Smith, the daughter of the Reverend William Smith and his wife, Elizabeth Quincy Smith, both descendants from distinguished Massachusetts clergymen, was a feisty woman of remarkable intelligence and determination, a woman of high moral standards who set goals for her offspring that they spent their lives trying to achieve. It was especially difficult for John Quincy Adams. He was the oldest boy in the family, born July 11, 1767, but his sister Abigail, called Nabby by the family, had preceded him by two years. Another sister, Susanna, followed him, but died the following year in February 1770. Then came Charles, who arrived on May 29, 1770, and Thomas on September 15, 1772. Johnny, as the family called him, was perpetually lectured about how he was the oldest son and had to set an example for his siblings. He had been born with gifts few others enjoyed, they told him, and was expected to live up to them and become a great man. Over and over, Year after year, his parents reminded him that he was privileged by birth and education, that he was destined to be a guardian of the laws of liberty and religion of your country, and that he must achieve a distinction in this life that would add to the family's already illustrious record of accomplishment. Abigail actually took Johnny to Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775, to witness the famous battle so that he could better understand the price of freedom and the trials necessary to gain and defend it. He was all of seven years of age. Years later, he still remembered Britannia's thunders and witnessed the tears of my mother and mingled with them my own over the death of a dear friend of my father, Dr. Joseph Warren, who fell in the conflict. It seems unbelievable, but this young boy was made to stand and watch the killing of men he knew. It must have been traumatic. From that moment on, Abigail taught me to repeat daily, after the Lord's Prayer, before rising from bed, the ode of Collins on the patriot warriors who fell in the war to subdue the Jacobite rebellion of 1745. What a terrible burden to lay on a child! And because his parents relentlessly spelled out his duties, reprimanded him when he failed to live up to them, and corrected every move he made that seemed to contradict their expectations of him, it is not surprising that he developed into a very introverted, self-critical individual of enormous pride and low personal esteem who suffered periodic and deep mental depressions.